Hey everybody, Andy here, helping you build a career you love. Great to have ya. Got a special one today on what's going on in the market. It's a little economics lesson. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So get in, if you're here with me live, say hi, get in the chat. I already see some of my faves and look who is first online, my mother. So be nice to her firstborn. Only good comments, please. Stefan, Adam, Cecilia, Donna, Jeff, my baby girl, and everybody else who is here. Great to have you. And if you're watching on the recording, welcome to you too while you're here. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and please click the thumbs up button if you like my content and share it because there's a lot of people that need help. And I'm gonna cap off today's talk with a little lesson on help. But what's today about? I wanna talk with you about what's going on in the market. We've got wages that are going up through the roof, right? We've got price, price increases, there's inflation. We've got for every one, or I should say, uh, two job openings, at least in the US, there's one unemployed person, so it's way out of whack. Inflation hasn't been this high since 1982, and we know that was a long time ago because that's the year I got my driver's license. So we're talking a long time. So how did we get here? I wanna talk about how we got here. I wanna talk about what it means to you right now and what I would do and what I think is gonna happen over the next 12 months. I'm gonna give you five tips and really these are reminders and, and some free giveaways and assets of, of where you can put these tips into place or to put these, put, put these tips into play. And, and, and when I talk about a history of how we got here, this isn't just gonna be a history lesson because what I really wanna do with this is try to give you my eyes, how I look at the market, how I look at history, how I predict trends, because I think the lesson inside going through the history and the evolution of how we got here is gonna be really valuable for you to be able to kind of project for yourself and the track that you're on or the path or career path or jobs or companies you wanna work for or paths you want to take okay so before I get into the macro lesson I want to talk a little bit about a, a kind of a mini history lesson and I know I have a lot of new people to my uh, to my community but some of you might not know this is the third year in a row right around this time where I'm doing a predictions type of talk and in March on uh, March 19th of 2020 when I finally realized what was going to happen in the market that 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 covid was here the pandemic was upon us it was becoming much more prevalent in my country in the united states i know it had been in in other countries and kind of you know spreading its way around the world and once i truly had a, an appreciation of what was about to transpire and what we were in for I, I came to YouTube and I talked with you about industries I thought would thrive, industries I thought would take a hit, what I wanted you to do tactically, how to best position yourself to make sure that you're surviving this effectively. And I can say, I was pretty dang spot on and you don't have to take my word for it because it's out there for you, to, for you to watch it. And then a year later, April 15th, 2021, I came back and I wanted to do another prediction show because because things were changing, right? The, the, the vaccinations were in place. We were starting to get them more in mass. More people were getting vaccinated and I thought it was important to talk about what was going to occur over the summer. I predicted the surge. I predicted the pullback in August. I predicted the surge again in September. We were in for a rock in time. All that's come true as well. Now, here we are. We've got different market conditions, as I mentioned, right? Wages are way, way up. Inflation is way Way, way up, right? Unemployment is, we call it full employment at the number it is. I know it doesn't sound full to some of you, but I'll explain, you know, that economic principle here in, in a few moments. So what happened? So you know what? I had a whole bunch of note cards and I threw them out because I, I thought, you know what? It might be better to give you, uh, to give you kind of some, some slides next to my head. Okay. So What's the situation report? What do we got? And let's talk a little a little history here as I take a sip out of my live off sours cup. Who doesn't love this? Andyisms on mugs, people. Make sure you get grab them. Okay. Mm. So what's happening right now? We've got prices and wages have been flat for a very long time. Okay? It's kind of milling along. And I mean a really long time. And I'm gonna show you a graph here in a second. But this is basically where we are. Unemployment 
in the last couple of decades has been really, really good, meaning really, really low, with the exception of the Great Recession, for those of us that lived through it, right, in 2008, when the market really cratered, and we went into a deep, deep recession. But other than that, it's been pretty, pretty good. And then the market's been strong. Companies were doing well, right? Everything was humming along and things were, things were pretty good. Oops, sorry. All right, so what do I mean by the market being flat? All I wanna talk about on this, on this uh, graph right now, this is a graph of unemployment and wages. I want you to look at the blue line. Okay, so the, the blue line is your wage growth. So you could look, so from 1983 down here over here on the left where I say wages are generally flat forever, uh, they've been really, really flat for a really, really long time. And you probably notice this, right? You're, you're earning about what you were earning and while you might be getting some pay increases, over the years, if you've evolved in a straight line career, that is, and you've kind of hung in with your employer or at least that career path, your, your wages have probably gone up ever so slightly, but the buying power really hasn't gone up. It's been pretty flat. Okay, so I just want I just want you to notice that here because that's an important principle. We'll come back we'll we'll come back to this in a second, and you could see just on this graph, uh, you know, April 2020 up here in the upper right hand corner, you can see how uh, how the unemployment rate was really high. But generally speaking, the unemployment rate over now we're looking at a 50 year span here, right? It's been about six percent, and one of the things for you to know is anything below four percent let's just say three for all intents and purposes. Basically, economists, financial assessors feel that the 3% line is like, is like zero unemployment. There's really no such thing as zero unemployment. There, there never will be. But it takes about 3% to get people in and out of their jobs each month. And so the 3% number, we generally consider the world is employed, or at least our nation is employed. Okay, so I just I, wa I want you to just take some note here, note here. All right, so then what happens? So the pandemic hits and a lot of people get out of work, right? You got a lot less income, especially if you lost your job. But but not everybody got hit, right? And, and, and so that I don't have to say this every single time I make a point, yes, I know that not everybody zigs at the same time, right? Some people zig, some people zag. Some industries zig, some industries zag. Some countries zig, some countries zag, right? Some are going up, some are going down. Basically though, organizations Okay, nay, the hospitality and leisure and travel and some of these others and, and, and restaurants and those. Most organizations were very strong. They were just a little bit disoriented. Okay, they, they, had, they hadn't operated in a remote capacity and so they had to figure out, and some companies, it took them a day, some companies, it took them a week, some companies, it took them a month, two months to figure out how to get the workers at home, situated, working effectively, right? We're all on Zoom sessions all day long. You get you get where I'm going with this, right? So so but but we didn't we we didn't really take a smash as far as most industries were concerned. All right, but so what what does that mean from a personal perspective? Well, people can't spend as much as they would like to spend, right? Because Number one, there are things that we just couldn't do, like go to a restaurant, right? Go to the movies. We just weren't doing things like that. We weren't taking vacations. We weren't we weren't spending in that capacity. We also weren't spending in some other capacities, right? I didn't, wasn't buying gasoline to get in my car to go to a drive to work to to park in a parking lot, right? So this is this is going on. And then there's a lot of people who weren't working at the time. So what does the U.S. government do? And I'm talking mostly about the trends in the U.S., but this is pretty common across the world. Our government, out of the goodness of their heart, pumps in $7 trillion. And I got news for you, folks. I know they did this out of the goodness of, the, of, of their heart, but there is absolutely nothing free in this world. You, it might be free at the moment, but, but you're going to have to pay pay it back at some point, whether you pay it back or somebody else pays it back, but you won't get anything for free. But there's a massive infusion of capital. You can't just shove $7 trillion into the economy while simultaneously, the years that this is going on, in 2020, 
the S&P, so five, 500 right, companies, the indices, the, the index is growing 18% in 2020 and about 27% in 2021. And what that means is for every dollar in my stock portfolio, now it's worth a buck and a half. So you're, you're infusing money into the market and a lot of people are not spending and their stock portfolios are going, are going up and up and up. But there's some other contributors that really, really got us to where we are. The white collars generally were spending, albeit maybe on Amazon and doing some other things. But now the paycheck to paycheck type of people, even their dollar got stronger because they had a little cash. They were also spending less. And even though they might have been out of work, people were tapping into their savings. They were tapping into the government subsidies. Even people that were working were getting government subsidies. Okay, and, that, and now you combine this with low interest rates. So what, is, what does that actually mean to most people? Well, when the interest rates are super low, debt is really cheap. So I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm clipping right along, right? Spending every day with you guys. Well, I refinanced my mortgage. I got a 2% mortgage on my house, right? So the debt is cheap and the debt that's cheap is hitting what is the largest, right? Largest generally expense for most people, most families. All right, so now follow me. Money's being pumped in, right? People are still earning. My stocks are going up. My portfolio's going up. I'm refinancing my debt, which is now going down or making it easier for me or cutting my mortgage t term in half or whatever. Psychologically, I'm feeling pretty good, right? I'm a fat cat right now. This is actually happening for most people, right? There are a lot of people that were out of work, but the majority of people were following this scenario. And then, and then what? Even people that were living paycheck to paycheck or were carrying high credit card debt they started to take the money that they were getting. This is statistical, I'm not making this stuff up, right? They were taking the money they were getting and they were paying down their highest percentage debt because they could get rid of it, okay? So all of this is happening. So, 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 so then what happens? So people get back to work, right? And But the employers, most of them were going pretty strong. They were trying to grow. Right? They're trying to find qualified people, except there's not enough people, and there's not enough people for so many reasons Right, that, that, that I'm going to show you here in a second. And then additionally, wages start to rise. Right, This is a natural reaction, cause and effect. So wages start to rise because I have to pay people who I might not otherwise pay, or I have to pay somebody who I would love to pay, except i got to pay them more to get them, steal them, or whatever. All right, so now I want you to look at this. I showed you the JOLTS report. I look at this every month. I showed you the JOLTS report last spring. And I was showing you into the summer, I showed it again, how like in June, July, right, it was like 10 million, 11 million open jobs. And I said, this is crazy. This is why we're gonna have high wages. You're in for a boom, grab it while it's good. Well, uh, well, this is actually a kind of a makeshift report here. I pulled some of this from JP, JP Morgan and I pulled some of this from Google, but basically, if you look at this graph right here and you see this huge spike in the middle, what this report is telling you is the Labor Bureau statistics uh, in, in the U.S. puts out stats every month about publicized job openings. Now, you know, Coach tells you, right? That's not all the jobs that are open, but let's go with the data we have because for illustrated purposes, it works to prove the point. There's 11.2 million openings known right now. Okay, that actually the, the I, I, I wrote this in red ink and then I looked back at the number and basically I was still going off a non-fully confirmed number, but basically it's 11.2 million openings. There's 6.3 million people unemployed. That's a, almost a two for one ratio. Now I know some of you are saying, well Andy, that's great, but I, I still can't find a job. Well, just because there's a job opening doesn't mean you're qualified for it. Just because there's a job opening doesn't mean you want it. Right kind of thing. But for illustrative purposes of why we're in the predicament we're in right now, or, or why things are rolling for you, it, this is one of those things. And you can see this huge, huge uptick right here. Right? This is, by the way, this has been going on. This, this is, this is 2021 and, and up to now. This report is as of February 28th, which was the latest data that I, that I could get. Okay, now I wanna show you this unemployment and wages graph again. Look at what's happened 
in this section over here, I already told you that unemployment's pretty low, but look at this blue spike here over on the right, kind of in the middle of the graph. I hope you can see my cursor moving around here, but look at how, how precipitously wages have risen. They had to do this as a reaction to the shortage, right? Demand against supply, you guys get that. I have demand for employees. I don't have enough employees. Why don't I have enough employees? Well, there's a couple reasons for this. All of these are contributing. Well, number one, there's pent up demand. What does this have to do with employment? Well, think about it. Didn't I tell you last year what industries were gonna rise and why? Clothing, apparel, a lot of, a lot of people racing back Right, revenge shopping, I think I called it. Except there's a lot of goods and other things. So now, how many of you would sit in a restaurant and wonder why the service was so bad? Right, because they were understaffed. How many of you wanted the sleeveless wetsuit from Roca last summer, except they couldn't get it in and they still don't have it in because they have supply issues? Right, so there's, there's a lot of pent up demand. You've got low inventory, so what happens? So now you got price increases, right? This leads to price inflation. Now, if you're a retailer, and this is an important point, if you're a retailer and your inventory's low, what do you do? Andy doesn't have enough time to have all those coaching sessions with all the people that wanna have him. He's only got so many hours in the day. What do you do? You raise your rates. Right, that's fine if you're a service, but what if you are actually a retailer of things? Well, if you're a retailer of things, while you can raise your prices, your revenue isn't necessarily going up because you don't have enough widgets to sell. And the worst part of this is the supply costs, the raw material, all of those prices are going up, so it's cutting into your profit. What do you do? You let employees go, right? So this is, this is what happens. So we're on the tip of this right now. All right, so wages go up because there's not enough employees. How many times do you see Andy bragging on his job search boot campers getting double pay and triple pay and 80% increases, right? Show of hands, you follow me, right? Yes, they're good people, but they're also in demand and they're having the perfect storm because I'm giving them all the interviewing and negotiating techniques that they need. But you get where I'm going with this, right? So you're getting, you're getting, you got a huge increase in, in wages that is exacerbated by the fact that we just had the largest population boomed in like birth booms, right? The baby boomers from 1946 to 1964, those people that were born in that uh, period, in that 18 year period or so, are now naturally retiring, higher than they normally would, right? And then you have the pandemic, which did what? which caused a lot of people in their 60s, some people in their 50s to hit retirement earlier. They were bought out or whatever. Now, some of them are out living the good life, maybe, maybe not, or maybe working at a partial capacity, right? So all of this, all of this is converging at the same time. So, so, so what, is, what, is, what does that mean? Well, when you look at, when you look at this, that these, this wage increase, What's gonna happen as a result of this wage increase? You got wage increases and price increases. Look at the last two times we were in a situation like this. Now, I will tell you, so if you're looking at the left side of the graph, this is the 70s, and look at that precipitous uptick. Slope looks pretty, pretty damn similar to the inflationary prices, which are in lockstep with the wage increases, okay? And what happened both times? Major meltdowns and recessions, right? It has to happen that way. You can't go up this fast without going down this fast because not only it is, it's a universal law, but governments are gonna be doing things to expedite the decrease to try to cool the economy off. Now, I won't tell you that history repeats itself because it never does, but it sure does rhyme. Right? There is always a mutation that occurs for why each of these big bumps occurred. Right, The reason this is coming up on the right side of the graph so quickly has to do with different factors than the reason this went up so quickly. Okay, So, so when, when you converge pent-up demand, price inflation with an inability to support the demand because you don't have enough supply and you don't have enough workers to do whatever it is that you need to do, this is gonna happen, right? You're gonna, they're gonna overpay, you're gonna overpay for what's available, and you're gonna overpay the people to get them in to help you, okay? So, so, so this is important, so here we are now. We're, at, we're, in, we're all the way on the right side of this graph, and we're all the way at the top, 
what I think's the top. I actually think this sucker's coming down and it's gonna come down in a hurry, okay? So, now, what are other signs you should be looking at? Well, what I also look at is I look at consumer spending. In January, everybody was still a fat cat and we were still smoking. 4.9% spending growth, that's, that's good, right? Spend, spend, spend. Well, now you look at the February number. February cools off, and what's really, really funny about this number, where it's almost flat, is that gas stations, gas station sales is included in this consumer spending number, and the gas station spending made up the lion's share of that 0.3% growth, and, and because of when the February numbers are collected, the Russian and Ukrainian war that has caused such price volatility in the oil prices, which made basically a gallon of gas, at least where where I am in the U.S., go up from $3.30 to $4.30, right? It went up the 30%, 30% wasn't even factored in. Now, that's going to skew the spending, and it's not really going to paint the right picture of what's actually happening because if gas prices are going up, what do I have? Less discretionary money because n most people don't consider gas to be consumer discretionary, right? So, so are we in for a slowdown? So what does this all mean? All right, so, so, so Andy, this is great. Well, what's going to happen? Well, we know interest rates are going up, right? So what happens when interest rates go up? Got any, got any economists here? Well, you know when interest rates go up, your, your fixed costs go up, right? So your big ticket items, the mortgages, the cars, gas is already up. That ain't helping, right? So all your fixed major costs that you do not consider discretionary are up. What does that mean? Everything else goes, everything else goes down, right? And then what? Demand goes down. That's what they're trying to do by raising the interest rates. What, is it, what happens when the demand goes down? You let people go. Now, not all sectors are going to let people go, but in general, this is the way the world works. What's the first thing to go? Non-essentials. Right? Who's following me so far? Who's following me so far? Give me a show of hands, right? I tried to do this one step at a time so that if you had absolutely no financial prowess, you can follow me, right? Who, who's, 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 who's following me, right? And one other thing, probably the most important thing for you guys, is when the stock market goes down, right, what happens? Employment market goes down, except they don't work in tandem. There's a delay, right? Stock goes down first, employment market goes down later. Then what happens? Stock market goes back up, right? Except what? The employment market might go back up or not. If we could have a jobless recovery. Why would we have that? Well, I'm going to give you some things to think about, okay? But first, let's talk about the current events effect and the trailing effect. Okay, I made these words up because I just needed some way to convey what I was trying to tell you. I just showed you a bunch of bullets, right? And a bunch of graphs. Because of what I just showed you, something immediate's gonna happen, all right? Sooner than later. Then there's always things that happen as a result of other factors. I'm gonna cover that next. So current events, first things first. Consumer discretionary is going to go down. This is not hard to see based on what I just showed you. And while there are certain other sectors that are going to go down, for illustrative purposes, let's talk about these guys. High-end apparel, right? Why do you think I buy $9 polo shirts? I love them. I just buy them on sale and I got all these weird colors because I just buy whatever they're giving away, right? So, so right? These are not really high end for me, but high end clothing isn't necessary. Anything luxury goods, anything associated with entertainment, all this other stuff is not necessary for me, right? Leisure activities, hotels, air. Now, air is not considered consumer discretionary. It's considered it's factored into industrial, except that you'd be a fool not to think airlines are going to get smashed again, right? Here, it, this is like a boxing match furniture, right? This is like a boxing match where you get knocked down in the fourth or fifth round and then, you know, you, you get up and you're kind of woozy and you're sort of recovering and by the eighth or ninth round, you're getting really tired and the big guy knocks you out. Okay, because I think you're going to get a double hit here and I don't think it's coming tomorrow, but it's coming soon enough. 
and I, I need you to be thinking in these terms. Now, I only use this industry for illustrative purposes, but there are going to be other industries that are going to be affected, right? Anything related. And let me, let me talk to you about that. And let me talk to you about that from what I consider to be a trailing effect. Now, autos, right, we need cars, but I don't have to buy a new car. I could, right, like, all, like, right, everybody wants the new car, but I couldn't, I didn't have the semiconductor chips, and I'm waiting for my new car, and I can't get, and I got to overpay, and they overpaid for my wife to give them the, her old car, or whatever, right, like, so you got to watch these certain sectors, but now you ha there's other things that you need to look at. There's other things that you need to look at. So this is kind of fun. Now, I don't know if you think like this, but I spent a lot of time thinking like this. There's trailing effects. What do I mean? So we have these things in this world that should have occurred that didn't occur. They're way overdue adjustments. And I'm talking about positive adjustments that make everybody's life easier. Except that as the world moves, they move too slow. As employers move, they move too slow. As people want to change, they change too slowly. Okay? And then what happens is some major event occurs that accelerates the trailing effect and brings it to the forefront of something that otherwise would never have occurred had the event not taken place. Okay? And then what happens? I just can't go back. I can't unsee what I saw. I can't live without that anymore. Right? I didn't know I needed to cook my food faster until somebody gave me a microwave, even though I don't use mine. What am I, what's an example, not even for my points that I'm gonna give you here in a minute, but what's a great example of this right now? How many of you show of hands are working from home right now? At least a few days a week, if not every day of the week? Do you think you're going back to five days a week even though, they, even though they're telling you we need everybody back in the office? Right? Any CEO that's work, that runs a company that does, that does not actually require individuals to be present to make it happen, like, okay, if I need to go see the doctor and I want to go to the hospital and get taken care of, the doctor better be there, right? The surgeon better be there. I get that. But most of us, 90% of the world doesn't work in an environment like that. Okay, yeah, I understand somebody's got to pick the stuff off the warehouse shelf, but most of us don't. So I just don't think that that's going to happen. Now, that isn't even what I want to talk to you about because I'm just trying to illustrate what I mean by a trailing effect. So something happens and now the trailer change is the way we operate, right? Which causes what? Zoom stock to go up, right? You got to be thinking like this. All right, let me give you a couple of examples. I got this bike. I just bought it. It's like eight, 10 feet away from me. This thing's a machine. It costs what my first car cost. It's so fast I was afraid I was going to fall off it when I rode it. Except I haven't bought a bike in 12 years. Okay? Now, last time I bought a bike, I went to the bike shop. And this nice man put me on electron an electronic device, hunched me over, put all these probes on me. It was like I was getting an MRI and an X-ray and a scan to get a bike. And he took all these measurements and he dialed it all up. And then like three months later, I had a bike, my road bike, which I love, which I still have and still ride to this day. And I needed him to do that. And then I bought this new souped up bike. So I got a road bike and now I got a, what's called a TT bike, a time trial bike. It's one of those like triathlon bikes that look real souped up and aerodynamic. So I go to, the, I, I find a new shop near my home. I really like this guy, Fred. I go in to deal with, work with Fred. I talk to him on the phone a couple times. I go in, I spend an hour or two with him. We go through the different bikes. We decide I'm going to buy this one particular bike. I said, this is great, Fred. Let's make it happen. He says, okay, well, this manufacturer doesn't sell through retailers. You, you got to order it online. So I'm going to pull you up online and then we're going to select all the stuff and boop, 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 or go home and do this and then come back and we'll order it. No problem. So I had to have, I'd order it ship it to this guy because he needed to, you know, dilute this and put air into that and drain this and that or whatever and a bunch of stuff I don't understand. So I paid him to put the bike together, basically. And how many of you would have, right, like, even if you just you go and buy a bike, right, you got to go into the store, you get on the bike or whatever, they, they sell you the bike. That's, that's what retailers do, right? And so things are starting to change. They're cutting out the sales per people, right? How many people? Love buying a new car. 
How many show of hands as I take a sip of this delicious tea? How many? I didn't ask you if you like new cars. I asked you about buying a new car. Right? When I, I buy a new car like once every 10 years, and I do it not just because I like to keep a depreciating asset, but the, the thought of having to go into a dealership and actually talk to a salesperson where I know I'm going to have to immediately get in my car, go home and take a shower because that's how I feel, and I'm a good negotiator, right? You follow me? Anybody buy a Tesla ever? I don't own a Tesla. What? What do you do? Doot, 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 doot. Where's the nearest Tesla little kiosk? Can I go and do a test drive, this and that? Right, you go, there's a nice person there who's not a salesperson but an employee to help give you the key. Whatever, you get in the car, you drive it, you come back. They say, you want to buy a car? Sure, go to the computer, dial up, we'll send it to your whatever. Right? I got my Mercedes serviced a couple, couple weeks ago on a Monday. On that Monday, I got it serviced on the Monday because I was having a productivity coaching session for two hours, gonna take up my whole afternoon. On a Monday, I said, this is great. Mercedes people, come to get my car. Nice lady came, they call her the valet. I handed her the key at 8.30. She goes, drives it to the dealership. They fix the car, they bring the car back, puts it in a driveway. I waved to her while I was in the middle of my live show. Never had to leave my Swiss ball. All day had my car taken care of. Right. Why? Because, because car dealerships have to do things like this because in 10 minutes from now, there's no longer going to be salespeople for me to go buy the car from there because they're not going to be there anymore because I'm going to go up online, I'm going to pull up the thing and I'm going to say, give me that model with a bunch of these things and put it, you know, dr drive it to my driveway. Right. So, so the, now I understand there's rules and regulations and governmental control of this or that, but that stuff will get broken down. But this is what I mean by if you're going to think about, do I want to be a car salesman? You need to be thinking about this and what the cause and effects are. You follow me? These are the trailers. These are the kind of things that you have to think about based on everything that's happening around you. Who's following me? Who's following me, right? What's the expression? I see somebody in there, D-City, hate buying cars and phones, right? What's the quote? What's the quote? It's easier to buy a Tesla than it is to buy an iPhone, right? Kind of thing. That was her quote, right? Kind of thing. So just think about that. All right, so I'm helping you read the tea leaves. If you're in the, if you're in the consumer discretionary industry, I would be doing a number of things to make sure that I'm like the baddest ass on the planet in that sector. If I'm deciding do I want to get into that sector, I might be thinking long and hard about whether I want to be doing this. And there's other sectors too. But I, I, wanna, I wanna give you guys what I, would, what I would do right now, no matter who you are. But I wanna, I just, these are not gonna blow you away. I just wanna remind you, this is good practice. And then I wanna cap this off with a little story. All right, number one. I told you March 19th, 2020, I did a talk on the industries that are going to thrive because of the pandemic. And I gave you 36 that I thought would thrive. 34 or five of them still will. IT, healthcare, security, these kinds of things are in great shape. However, however, you just got double pay. You just went from 100,000 to 200,000. What do you think is going to happen if there's a pullback? And the semiconductor company you work for doesn't need to manufacture as many semiconductors to get them to the cars that aren't selling to whatever. No, everything is connected, all right? Everything is connected. So even if you're in a thriving market, you need to make sure that you are paying attention. And then the other thing that I would do is I would skill up. Now, a couple of weeks ago, maybe Stacy, if she's really dancing, can tell me the date I actually gave the talk. Uh, it was probably early in March like maybe the third or the the second or third or fourth or whatever that Thursday was, where I gave you a limited edition live show and I talked to you about the skills I would build and the sequence I would build them and what the specific skills are and these transcend roles and industries. And I gave you a whole booklet, like a 35-page uh, assessment booklet, a methodology, my roadmap, um, what I would do, how to build my skill development plan, and so on. That limited edition is still up for a little longer, it, probably another week or so. So if you're here with me live, make sure you grab that. Stacy can drop that link in the chat. 
and as well as as actually um, Stacy, can you or or Kara, can you drop the download of the leadership roadmap in in um, in there for them to take the 35 page booklet that outlines all that stuff, the free giveaway, the thick thick free giveaway, and then I would check that out and I would really pay close attention on skilling up, and then I would become indispensable. I don't care who you are, I don't care what you work for, okay? Um, one of the things I would do by indispensable, here's what I mean. You are not indispensable if you're good at your job. And you are certainly not indispensable even if you are great at your job. Because if you are great at your job and I think I'm paying you twice what I could pay for somebody who's 90% as good as you, you're not indispensable, okay? But when you start to become so great at what you're doing and you become so versatile, meaning I can do the person's job that way, and I can do the person's job this way or that way. So I could do the job before me, the job after me, or a portion thereof. I'm integrated with the customers and really understand their business. And I'm talking to the vendors and the integrators or whatever. Like, you need to become the linchpin of what you're doing. You need to become so, you need to learn everybody's job on your team right now. I don't care how you do it. Spend the time. But start making yourself indispensable because even if you got a great job and even if you're getting paid a tall dollar, it's coming. I'm telling you, it, it's eventually going to hit you. Okay. Nothing goes up this fast and stays up and keeps going, right? Are you going to halt or are you going to drop? Okay. And if you're in one of the other more susceptible sectors, you need to really be on your toes. Okay, so I would, I would do that, and then I would make sure I'm communicating with my manager. So I would, talk to, uh, I would talk to my boss, my boss's boss or whoever, and I would, I would express to them, look, I want to learn these other things. Hey, what, what constitutes success? What constitutes a stretch success, a stretch goal? How could I do that? What do I need to do? When can we have our checkpoints? Right? Can I, can I cross train, up train, do this and that? Can I pick up some additional responsibilities? Is there anything you're doing that I could take off your hands? All that stuff. Now, if you are actually in my leadership coaching program, you have the Career Accelerator, I show you how to do this, and you have the sessions on, right, preparing for your promotion, planning your career development plan, you have, you have the negotiating your race, all that other stuff that you can do where you can foresee and plan all this in advance. Remember, it's chestnut checkers. Okay, so make sure you're, you're communicating and pay attention to the trends. This is what I mean. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something and I want to cap this off with a quick story. When, the, when COVID hit and I'm looking around and I'm thinking we're gonna get, people are going to be home, Zoom stock, Amazon, they're going to be getting everything delivered. You don't just buy Amazon stock. You look at the Echoes. I go and I buy every cardboard box stock I can. Who makes paper? Who makes the stuff that Amazon needs? That's an echo, right? You need to look beyond two feet in front of you. All right, and let me talk to you about echoes. And I was thinking about how I wanted to end this talk, and I want to give you a story. Bear with me. It's five, about maybe five minutes long, but I think it, it is a great cap on this, and it talks about echoes and it, it it's part how to it's, it's part motivational and it's really really about perspective but i think it i think it puts what i want you to do in a different light let's go back to march march 19th 2020 during that time so two years ago right now middle of the month couple day about a week before i was going to give the talk on march 19th which was a thursday i was sitting in that chair Okay, I hope you can see it. I'm in a four by three. And I was sitting in that chair. And unlike a lot of people, when I have ideas, I don't go to Google and I don't look stuff up. Just like, you know what? I mean, how many of you have turned your brain off completely because every friend, even your mom's phone number is in here and you don't remember it, right? So what do you do when you want to do something? You go to Google instead of actually thinking. Let me tell you about what I was actually thinking about. I decided I want to give a talk. I decided I wanted to tell you what industries are going to thrive. So the first thing that I did was I went back there. I grabbed a cup of coffee. I went back there. I sat in the chair and I went room by room in my head, in my house. Okay. Looked at the computer. Zoom stocks going up. Went into the kitchen. Right. More cooking stuff. 
right? I go around the house. I get to the basement. I get to the basement and in the basement is where my wife and I have a number of things, but among them is our workout equipment, the treadmill, her Peloton, my bike setup, the pull-ups, the bands, the whole nine yards. I'm thinking home equipment, right? Okay, then I'm thinking, all right, outside the health clubs. Health clubs are gonna get smashed because people can't go to the health club. Okay, people can't go to the health club. People won't drive to the health club. People won't park at the health club and so on and so forth. Then I'm thinking, hmm, I used to belong to this amazing health club. The reason I belonged to this amazing health club that was in downtown Chicago, I didn't live in downtown Chicago, but I worked in downtown Chicago. I used to go to the health club near my house in the morning. I would work out, shower, and get in my car and spend like an hour and a half sitting in my car trying to get to work because the traffic is awful, even though I lived, say, 25 miles away from my office. So I decide I'm going to join a health club downtown. Awesome health club. Every day I would get up and at 4.45, I'd hop in my car, I would drive down to the health club, I'd get there by 5.15 or 5.20, right when the door opened, I'd walk in, I'd work out, grab the smoothie, grab the coffee, get in my car, drive over to my office, I'm at my desk by eight o'clock. I'd go home. But on the weekends, I would go down there and I would work out in, in the morning on Saturdays and Sundays and I would take longer, I'd grab breakfast, I'd get in my car and then I'd come home. Different route, I'd take a different street. On the street that I would go on led me to a feeder ramp to get to the expressway to get home. But on, in this route, there was two things that were absolutely certain once I was about to get on the feeder ramp. There's a stoplight and two absolute truths. I got caught by the light every single time. That's one. And the second thing was there's a homeless person who was there who would ask me for money. You know, they kind of would hold up the cardboard or they'd wear the cardboard box, right? I need food and that kind of stuff. So I always had cash in my pocket. So every time I would pull up to that light, I would roll down the window and I'd give them five bucks. Five bucks on Saturday, five bucks on Sunday, all year long, except when Thanksgiving rolls around. Between Thanksgiving and Christmas, what I would do is every week or a couple times a month, I would go to Target, I would stock up, I would buy all these gallon plastic glad bags or whatever and I would fill the shopping cart with everything that these homeless people could could that I could think of that I they could use that I could fit in a bag I mean I would put baby powder and toothbrushes and toothpaste and soap and and mittens and cash and whatever and I would give 10 bags away on Saturday and 10 bags away on Sunday and I did that for a month okay so now fast forward it's 2020 but I don't belong to that health club anymore and I don't drive down there because my wife and I in 2017 moved in this house. It doesn't make any sense. It's really far away. So I'm sitting in the chair. I'm running through my house mentally and I'm thinking about all the stuff that's gonna happen and I start to think about the health clubs. Then I start to think about the street. Then I start to think about the homeless people. And I think, who's gonna take care of them, right? So a couple days later, the weekend hits. I go into the Target. I fill up the 20 bags, I go down, I drive all the way downtown, and I drive around until I can get 20 of these away. And I think about the echo. Would you think about something like that ever? And I will tell you, we are all connected first. Everything you do, cause and effect. What you do has a cause, what you say has a cause, what you don't do, don't say has an, has an effect. Your causes have an effect. It will ripple in places you will never visit and you won't know. So the one thing that I really want you to do is I want you to think proactively about what you do and what effect it has on others. And I want you to think about if you do something, do that before if you do something, think about what effect could it have and reflect on it. And those, you know, we're all moving at a breakneck pace. If you would slow down and just think about everything that's around you. I came up with 32 of those 36 industries without turning a computer on. And I'm telling you, you've got to, you've got to slow down. You've got to force yourself to stop and think about what's going on around you or how what you're doing affects everything around you. And you start thinking like that, and I guarantee you will start doing the right things that pay the dividends that you need to. And I, the last thing that I would say is, for the love of all that is holy, the next time you bitch or moan about something, I want you to think about this story and think about those homeless people. 
and think about how good you got it. All right. So I hope you like that. If you're here with me live, we're going to the we're going to the Q and A. If you're watching this on the recording, I'll see you next week. But I really hope you enjoyed that and got a lot out of it. And more importantly, I hope it helps you think about how to think and what to think about. All right. I'll see you soon. Be good. All right. Where are we at? I knew 45. I could get that in. I almost didn't throw that story in. I've never told that story about the homeless people ever. But I thought about that two years ago. So it was probably like March 12th, 2020. Mm. All right. What's what? Let me see. Did ever, can everybody say hi to my mom? I don't know if my mom is still here. If you enjoyed this, click the thumbs up button. Uh, Gemma Camp, is this just for the U.S. or global? We're all tied. I mean, stuff that's happening in Russia and Ukraine is affecting us, right? You're, you're, nobody's insulated. Sure, Kara, grab, grab some questions from the chat. Let me go through and say hello. Here, I'll go to the, you know, grab some, see if you can, you know, maybe feed me some, uh, some of those. I got two quick announcements while you do that. First thing is... I have been teaching productivity all month long. I got another session on Monday. It's about energy, and I want to tell you something about energy. Uh, You know, a lot of us think about energy, we think about our vibrancy, and that's true. There's an internal component to energy, but what people don't think about energy is, I don't, I'm I'm, I'm a vibrant person. I'm, I'm always alert, awake, right? Time to go to bed, I go to sleep, wake up. Go at it 100 miles an hour again. Just think about this. Here's another thing to think about. I don't, I don't evaluate my energy based on, you know, how, you, how I feel about you or you feel about me. I, my external evaluation of my energy is about how you feel about yourself in my presence. There's a huge distinction. And I want you guys to remember that when we talk about the echoes and we talk about what you do and the cause and the effect. When you're around people, how do they feel about themselves in your presence? Think about that. How do you make those people feel about themselves? Good stuff, right? All right, Energy Monday, and you're not going to see me Thursday next week because I'm going to be with people in my job search boot camp, the coaching program. We got a great session. We're going to do some hot seating. That's going to be a ton of fun. If you're interested in that, let us know. All right. All right. Cecilia Steen, my boot camper, what's up? Regarding your salary negotiation tip from previous video, you said that if someone goes back and asks for more, even without any good arguments, they will probably get $5,000. I did say that just by asking. I did say that. Even if you didn't know what you're doing, you said, I want more. You were correct. Oh, there you go. I asked them to consider a slight increase and I got bumped a grade in a $10,000 increase without any further discussion. Oh my God, I love it. I love it. All right, Cecilia, that's awesome. Boot camper Cecilia. Adam Stark, what is up? What type of language will make your boss hunt message sound more assertive and short and sweet? Adam, this is the 15th question that you've asked me about boss hunting messages. It isn't the language. If you use the language that I gave you, it will work. It isn't trying to get 1% better. Just don't make it any percent worse. Just use the template. Believe me, it isn't the template. It's your execution, the mechanics, the consistency in sending out the messages and Feed the damn, wait, can you see it? I don't know if you could, can, can you feed, see it? Feed the, feed the damn funnel, will ya? Just feed the funnel. It ain't the, it ain't the letter. It ain't the letter. Donna Morley, Jeff Comstock, baby girl, what's up? All right, where are we going? Kara, are you just giving them to me from the chat? I got the chat. Uh, Doug Milligan did final round interviews with company without an offer. Saw a different job on their site, recently connected with the interviewers on LinkedIn, suggested way to network to suggested way to network and interview for other for other role. Doug, I want you to go into the boot camp. I want you to go into the did you the rejection, the resuscitation, 
and do those things. And, and, and the other thing is I would go back to the recruiter. I would not even bother trying to network with all those people. Go back to the recruiter, say, hey, I loved working. At, sorry I didn't get in there. Are you recruiting for this other role? Am I a good fit? And so on. Just go direct. But if you want to do the other stuff, check those in the boot camp. Michael Moore, what's up? Keith, how are you from Johannesburg? MD from Chicago. Hello to Johannesburg. Okay. Gary Hoover, what's up? Terry Hoffman, great to see you guys. Richard Frain. Johnny Stevens. Dude, what's up? How you been? All right, Kara, are you are you just giving them to me from the chat or are you because I could I could I could just zip down. Ron Tehrani, Andy Nomics is right. Can't wait to hear Andy has to say about John. Uh, Tracy, my Instagram friend, how you doing? Is the graph you posted adjusted for inflation? Yeah, actually, uh, you can get, just Google any graph you want and you put in anything you want. Wondering about wage increase and purchasing power. There is no, wait. Your wages didn't go up and prices didn't go up. Your purchasing power has been the same. I, sh I kid you not, for as long as you've been alive. Tom Phillips, Laurentiu, Jeff uh, Soldner. I don't know if it's Soldner. Let's see. Johnny Stevens, where are you at? Hang on. How do you negotiate using market research with a non-standard title? I don't negotiate based on market data or the title. I negotiate based, okay, so here, here's the thing. So remember this, and you know how much I love you, brother. Okay, I got this thing here. My coach said that every engineer's getting paid whatever. Doesn't matter, I don't care what they're paying. I don't care if everybody got a C on their test in school. It makes no difference. One company will pay that project manager one hundred fifty thousand. And another company will pay him one hundred. Another company will pay him two hundred. And some company will think he's worth eighty. Okay. It isn't about the title. It isn't about the whatever. It isn't about your market data and your market data. Just you folks know this. Any salary data that you have that was collected from anywhere is outdated the minute you lay your eyes on it, because employers. Wait, did you see the spike? Okay, employers have to pay what employers have to pay to get you. That's what determined this house. I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I, I'm not. I moved in the house. Not one time have I looked at Zillow or Redfin or whatever, because it makes no difference to me what the house next door sold for or any of that stuff. This house is worth what this house is worth on the day I sell it. That's it. That's it. Right? So you are worth what you are worth based on what how I value the position. The argument you could make to the value you're going to contribute, which is wholly based on what you're going to do as a result of what I'm scoping you to do. That's it. And you make your argument from the inside, not the outside. I don't care what the market data says. I don't care that your friend's making whatever, go work over there. That's what I would say to you. I really would. I, I, this is how I value the position. You're making an argument that we're gonna make more money as a result of you doing this or that. Are you gonna make something faster and save me a whole bunch of time? Are you gonna make it so that I don't need to hire that extra engineer who's gonna cost me 80 grand and I, don't, I could delay it for six months worth 40 grand, right? That's not in a table somewhere, right? That's how you do that. Deb, what's up, my boot camper? Isn't the low unemployment artificial because so many longer unemployees can no longer claim employment benefits in many states? Where are they accounted for? Yes, that's right. They are not. They're done. And also, there's 11 point something million jobs that are open, and those 11 million jobs are 20% of the actual total number. So there's 60 million jobs open right now. That's the truth. So that, that is true, but I can't determine where all those people are and the government doesn't know where all those people are because their unemployment benefits ran out. Okay. And yes, I know some of you 
are unemployed. Maybe your unemployment has run out. Maybe you've been unemployed for a short time. Maybe you've been unemployed for a year or two or longer. I mean, this happens, right? Like I said, not everybody zigs at the same time. John Kurt, what's up, buddy from Chicago? Stefan, my good man, how are you? Well, didn't you have a question early on? No, maybe that was, I thought I saw it. Maybe you were just saying, hey, Anne, what's the good word? Frank, Veronica, Andrea, Johnny, Oscar, Patty, Angela, Janae. Oh my God, Dana, what's up? Dana, I love my bike. Ah, oh, I just love it. I've ridden it for a whopping total of 25 minutes. Just to make sure I can zip through everything. Fix it, Fox. Fix it, Fox. I hope you're still here because I owe you a huge apology. Dead serious here. Okay, fix it, Fox. Or fix it, Fox. Are you still here? Can you tell me? I, I want to know if you're actually still here. And I know we're on a delay, but even if you're not here, I still want you to hear this. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you asked me about opening up your own YouTube channel. And I think you're an engineer, if I, if I remember correctly. And you were talking about you wanting to get and kind of do what I do and doing it for engineers and, and so on. And I watched back what I said to you. And I am extremely sorry for that because, number one, when you asked me that question, and, and for those of you that were not here, um, Fix It Fox, whoever that is, I wish I knew your name, asked me about, you know, kind of opening up the YouTube channel and all this other good stuff. And the minute that I read that, what came pouring back, I hope you forgive me for this, is, is every ounce of pain that I went through to, to do this. And you, you folks... You cannot possibly imagine how difficult this is and how much pain you will endure and how many hours you will work and how much longer it will take and all that stuff. And not to be dramatic about this. And anybody who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something. Okay? And I'm not talking about, hey, I've got a product that's going to expedite your searching. Right. I'm going to give you a blueprint for that. But I'm saying if you want to do what I do, it's going to happen right away. I have money. I had a team. I have every business skill you can imagine. I had to learn how to use a camera and turn the lights on. Okay, and it still took me that long. And so what I did was I discouraged you just like a well-meaning parent would do. And that's not me. That's not why you guys come here. And you come here and I feel like my goal is to help make you confident about what you want to do. But what I want you to know, Fix It Fox, is if you, are gonna, if you have an inkling of undertaking what I'm doing, and I told you, my LinkedIn feed is filled with the blood of people who reached out to me who said they were going to make a go of it only months later to where I see them you know, networking and trying to get back to work or taking a job somewhere else because they didn't understand how much pain they were going to have to endure. The suffering was worth it to me, right? I've talked to you guys about when you choose your path, you better choose something you are willing to suffer for. If you are not willing to suffer for it, you're never going to make it. And any coach out there that does what I do, that's listening to me right now, that thinks, well, it's, it's not as bad as Andy sounds, I got news for you, Who anybody who's listening to me. They either aren't trying to make it big, it's a side hustle, or they don't really care. Or maybe they're just, you know, a second income and all their expenses are paid and they don't really need to work hard to make it happen or they just don't care about making it happen for you, for the people they serve. Because if you have dreams of making it big, I guarantee you're going to suffer. You don't hear about the 1,000 or 1,200 days in a row that I work, right? That, and I'm not talking about checking email on a Saturday. I'm talking about humping it 10, 12 hours on the weekend each day, right? You guys don't see any of that. You see me show up on Thursday. Right. Or maybe, you know, during a monthly session in a, in a private co coaching or something like that. So fix it, Fox. I judged that you were not able to hack that. And that is not me and not the way I roll. So I hope I hope you accept my apology. 
I, I really would love to encourage you to do it, but I really, I really want you to be thoughtful about investigating what it's gonna take. I want you to put a plan together, and then whatever plan you put together, I want you to quintuple it, because it's gonna take you five times as long, because there are so many things that need to be tweaked each time you do something. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I have run, I've worked for billion dollar companies and consulted them on mega million dollar deals. I've transformed processes. I've re-optimized a global oil company's entire business. I've run large scale projects. I've never done anything this hard. So it's, it's, you better want it. So I encourage you to do it if you're willing to suffer for it. Okay, and I'll, I'll help you in any way I can. And I'm so glad you're here. I hope that you're here, or I at least hope you see this. Uh, and you know what? Maybe I'll go on a YouTube comment if you're not here, and I'll, I'll at least point you to the time. But I know, I know that if you want it badly enough, and you're willing to suffer for it, and you're willing to put the time in, then it'll happen. It'll happen. It will. All right. Oh, God. I told <laughs> You ain't get, I ain't crying. I ain't crying this time. I totally forgive you and appreciated your honesty and not, nothing to apologize for. I had to apologize for me. You forgive me for you, right? And, uh, and let's, let's do it together. All right. Um, so, thanks for your answer to my YouTube comment question yesterday. I took a shot. <laughs> I know none of you know what I'm laughing at. Fix It Fox asked me something on the YouTube channel and I think yesterday morning in my morning session of responding to my YouTube comments, I told him what I would have said and it would have been, thank you very much for being you know, crystal clear that you are not the company for me and I'd have immediately went home and taken a shower because anybody who does that, I would have felt so icky, that, like kind of like the car salesman thing. All right, I love it. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, thanks for that, buddy. I appreciate it. All right. All right, let's see. Zipping on down. Zanata, how are you? Knowledge. Actually, knowledge isn't power. The application of knowledge is power. But yes, I like it. I like it. And yes, the... the, the yes, that is true. It's only people receiving benefits. But you get the idea. All right, where are we going? Where's Angela Butcher? Hey, I love the picture. Rachel! Andy of all trades. Yes. You, Rachel, you throw anything at me. Baby, I, I got you covered. Maxim, what's up, buddy? Got job consulting offer. Nice company and job. They want me to work 60 hours. Of course they do! Which is less cool family guy. Yes, you are. Young man, family guy. How to negotiate my boundaries and make it strict make it straight at negotiation. Maxim, I, you know you know how much I love you, buddy. I'm gonna give it to you straight. If you are interviewing with any of those big boys and big girls that I think you are, right, because we talked about this, uh, it, isn't, it, is, it isn't negotiable, meaning, meaning you're gonna have to work. That's just the way they roll. And it is, it is very hierarchical. It is very order-based. It is you do this, otherwise you're out of here, uh, kind of thing. So the question, what I would, what I would say back to you is, it isn't about can you negotiate that. My question to you would be, is this the kind of company you want to work for? Because they are not going to change. They just aren't. And and the more concessions you make in an environment like that, where the expectations of the employees are high, it's. It's not negotiable. It's not, it, it's not gonna be effective negotiating. I think, I think the, the real question here is, do you wanna work for that kind of company? Because that's gonna happen. It is gonna happen. That's the lifestyle. Sam, what's up, buddy? Just had my annual appraisal. It went great. Received salary increase with inflation 7.2 percent what is optimal increase there is no optimal increase buddy it is about it is about the the value i came in at top 10 percent of 30 uh it isn't it isn't about the percentage because did you notice did you notice on that graph hang on let me see if i get 
Hey, let me see if I can get back. Let me see if I can get back to this graph. Th did you notice that the? Here we go. Okay, look at this. Oops, sorry. Hang on. Where'd my cursor go? There we go. Um, look at this. You see this thing here up in the in the headline CPI. This is the inflation, seven point one, seven point five kind of thing. Okay. 7.5, you see that, right? Do you see this, 6.9? It's in lockstep, right? This, these are averages, people, right? But prices are going up this high, wages are going high. This, these are US stats. So it isn't about, it isn't about um, you know, what's the right percentage. I don't know what you, right like I don't know what your job function is specifically. I don't know how much value you're adding. I don't know what the roles look like. I don't know what the staff makeup looks like, and so it's it's really difficult to tell. It really is. You guys always have to work from home, right? Claudia, you're welcome. Ian, Ian 49th, my boot camper. And I know you've been out a while, buddy. I, I'm sending you good good juju. I hope I hope things pick up. Not sure about working from home in order to impress boss, so I'm needing to buy a car in order to work at an office an hour away. So how to negotiate. So, a couple things. Let's take two scenarios. In one, on the one hand, if you if you're in a situation where you've been out of work, I think you said you were out of work for a couple of years or whatever. You're out of work and hey, I need to take the job. You know, that's one thing and you're feeling, because the negotiation comes from here, right? You're feeling like I need to take this. And so you gotta decide, am I willing to do that? Yes or no. If you are willing to do that and you already know that whatever they give you is acceptable or you'll, you can still try to negotiate, but if you start to negotiate, the part about the fact that you had to get a car and you ha you're going to pay for gas, which is going to be expensive, right? We, we know this. It just is anywhere you live. So what I do then is I, I, I actually I'm going to give you a quick tip. And I also want to point you, Ian, to a video where I, I go into detail about exactly how to do what you're asking. Because what you're doing is you're pulling in an emotional factor that's emotional to you that has nothing to do with value to them, right? Meaning if you have to spend an hour in the car to get here at nine o'clock or eight o'clock or whenever you guys start and you have to spend an hour going home, that's nothing to me, right? I don't notice that, right? I, I wanna know what you're doing between eight and five, nine to five, so to speak, and the value you're gonna contribute. So it's an emotional factor to you, which you're gonna factor into your decision, right? And so what I, what I need to do is I need to take into account your feelings at the very, very end, because it's the last item that I want to factor in at the very end, because up until the very end, we're going back and forth about your value. When you start interviewing, I don't care. When you're midway through, I don't care. I don't care how long you got to commute. I don't care whatever, right? I'm about to give you an offer. I still don't care. You're going to come back to me and give me a counter offer. I still don't care, okay? Now we're getting to the point of, hang on. I'm really invested in this guy. I really want to make this work. And if I don't give Ian some kind of reimbursement for combat commute pay and gasoline pay, I'm going to lose the guy. And if I lose the guy, now I go into, now I go into what? Cost benefit, sunk bias cost. I just spent six weeks interviewing this guy. It's taken me three months just to find somebody. If I lose this guy because he wants this much more pay because he's got to drive an hour, I want to... Sh you know, I'm gonna pull my hair out of my head because I'm gonna have to start over. That's where it comes into play. Okay, so you gotta save it all the way in. I got a video for you. Stacy, can we give can we give uh, Ian, our boot camper, the video on the salary negotiation trick to save to the very end or to pull in it out at the very end or something? Do you guys get that, right? You 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 heard my paint story, right? The paint story with the living with my family room. Right, and I moved into the, to this house. Right in 2017, we had all the rooms painted except the kitchen. And the lit in the family room was just fine, except my wife didn't like that. There wasn't a chip in the paint, and I loved it. And but my wife wanted to change it, 
and she wanted to paint these cabinets and oil paint this and that and whatever, you know, thousands of dollars. I'm like, I don't value it at thousands of dollars, right? We're negotiating, right? Just like a salary negotiation, except what? My wife and I are a what? A team. What does that mean? I have to care about her feelings because if she doesn't like, right? If she's feeling bad, the team doesn't do well. While I don't value I valued the paint in the family room at zero. She valued it at thousands of dollars. And so guess who won? She did, right? Because I value my relationship with my wife. With my wife. Ian, that, remember the Andy silly family room story? If you haven't heard that one already, it's true. True, true story. Hilarious. Okay. Michael Moore, buy an old car. I don't blame you, buddy. All right, what do we got? Janae, what's up? I mean, Bradley Stone, man, what's up? Where you been, my boot camper? I mean, who likes buying a new car? I love the new car. Oh, you have a Tesla? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm gonna buy an electronic car next. I am. Uh, Software replaces sit well, maybe. All right, where questions? I'm looking for question marks. Hey, uh, Stacy, can you can you, as I asked you before, can you pop in the leadership assessment or Kara? Can you pop in the leadership? Uh, hang on, guys. Okay, pin pin, pin that pin that in the chat. Uh, Ian, you got another one here? Let's do a, a Ian back to back. Would it make sense to ask for a pay cut, say 30% at the beginning of a recession, so as not to be common fodder on pink? No, I would not do that. So I would focus on skilling up and making myself as invaluable as possible. I wouldn't do that. Don't give the money back and don't give it away before you can get it. Let's see, Claudia, any suggestions for a career change? I have the heart of a teacher, finance background, love the warehouse environment. So I would try to look at the intersection of what you know. Let me give you a great example. Yesterday morning, I did a coaching session with a woman who's been in, in the academic world for a long while. She uh, was an assistant professor. She has her undergrad, her educational master's, her PhD, and now she's getting in. A, she's starting an MBA program in a, in a couple of weeks. She loves education. She is a data guru and a research guru. So to get out of academia, we're targeting what educational software companies, commercial companies that build software for the education space. You follow me? So if you're, you have the heart of a teacher, a finance background, and love warehouse, what is the intersect, what do you actually have? A finance background. What can you, what can you do with that? So when you say warehouse environment, I'm not sure if you mean like in a manufacturing in inventory, uh, but but there are loads of opportunities that you can leverage your finance background. But I don't know what direction you want to go. But you you need to do like what she did to figure out is there a connection point between what I have and what the next logical opportunity could be if I want to make a change. So what I always say to people is the less change in the change, the faster and more successful the change will be. So she's not changing her knowledge or function. She's, she's in a space she understands, education, the industry. She's changing from academic uh, academia to commercial. That's a change, except she's keeping intact her domain knowledge, her function knowledge, and her industry knowledge. And so you need to think in those terms. Oh, you know what? I don't know that I have the card. But that, that's how to think through that. All right. 
buzzing on down. Patty, that's how I live every day. I love it. Hey, Christy Ehlert. Mackie. Uh, Terry Washington, thank you for asking. Yes, Harley and I were at the cardiologist on Tuesday. Uh, he's got a little bit of a murmur, but he had, he had without going into the whole, the whole fiasco, he's right behind me. Uh, we had a very, very serious episode, and we weren't sure if it was a cardiac issue, and apparently it's, it's not. So uh, we, we're, we're I'm, on, I'm on like 24 by 7 Harley Watch right now. And my wife is not home this week. So I'm like, I like, I get to take him everywhere with me. Hey, mom. Reiko, what's up? Ian, it was homeless for a few months. Oh, my goodness, buddy. Yes, mom is in the house. Hey, Manisha. Uh, Manisha, uh, renewable energy is here to stay. That ain't going away. That ain't going away. I love it. Mark Manzanares, what quote? I will remember that from now on. I'm not sure what quote that was. Tom Phillips, it, one is desperate. I think this is a quite, there's always crappy jobs. It's true. Looking for the question marks. Tracy, I'm getting a job interview earlier than expected in my career. Tracy, that's because you're in the boot camp. You, you, people know this. Like when you get into boot camp, you get anti energy too, and the juju, and all the stuff that converges and conspires to, to make it happen for you. You're a gunner, man. You're, I, I would expect nothing less. What aspects of an industry should I study if I have less time to prepare than expected? Major market trends. So, I mean, for the industry you want to get in, right? Environmental, social, governance, right? Like, I mean, there, there's, I would, I would be reading up on the latest trends to make sure that I was familiar with where they're going, why they're going in the direction, and look for the echoes. What's going to happen as a result of? Right. So it's that kind of, you I would be pouring. There's tons of stuff you can find on that. Uh, H H O O O. Ho, ho, ho. But hey, Andy, do you have any specific tips or a video about interviews with a university position or group interviews where you are talking to three to four current staff? You would be amazed at how many people I coach that are getting jobs at universities, assistant deans, principals, uh, um, deans, and all, you know, all kinds of, I mean, principals at other, you know, schools, high schools, and, but uh, major, major stuff. And generally speaking, you have shorter interviews with more people, and they ask you certain spe and specific questions. But the mechanics of how you go through that process is not any different than anything else that I shared. And the panel interviews, you're, if you do them on Zoom, which is what a lot of these people that I'm coaching are doing, uh, basically they get like very specific questions and they just answer them. And they get a very, very short amount of time at the end to ask some questions. I would just be prepared to that. But I have, I have videos on my YouTube channel about panel interviewing and I have videos on my on my YouTube channel about video interviewing. And if that's what you're doing, I would do that. And remember that, you know, in a 30 minute interview, you might get five questions, right? That's kind of how they roll. Uh, and you and you often go through a lot of them and I don't know what position you're interviewing for, but like some of these deans are, they're like multi-day things, like in a row. So, so ha say hang in there and good luck. Ricardo, can we get Ricardo the link to the mug shop? You know, I got 10 Andyisms out. Well, this isn't an Andyism, although I know we need to change some of the back, but this explains what live office hours is. And, and then in the Andyisms, it explains what an Andyism is and gives you a definition. And we, you know, it's really hard when you put this stuff in order to see exactly how it's going to look. So I got some mugs and now we got to, we got to revamp the artwork, but it's, these are really cool. And they're all kind of a similar, I got to be the zebra one. That's a really good one I like. 
if you just look below the video, I'm guessing there's the, you know, the mug shaft that you, or the mug shaft that you need. And Janae, Janae, yes, Anders Shonis, Ron Clark, I highly recommend the bootcamp. It will answer these questions and so much more. It's priceless. It's true. Folks, uh, I'm giving you a long shout here. The bootcamp price is going, is going to go way up, okay? Like double. So I'm going to give you a forewarning, but I'm telling you, if you get in now, you're going to get in for a great rate. Email Kara at support at milewalk.com. Ask her about what's what. If you have any questions, we'll get back to you. Um, the price is going up. The features are coming down. I mean, like it's we're making a lot of, of structural changes. I mean, the, everybody who has it will have it, and you will get everything that I've already offered. But we're re, we're going to be rearranging this, and it, it's going to be soon, uh, like within the next you know several weeks. Uh, Adam, consistency is what Maxim is telling you. Uh, consistency is what makes your boss hunting work. Uh, I get 60% response rates with the template. Actually, you know what? I don't know that I'm gonna I'm gonna be able to show this on the fly. Um, let me see if I can pull this up. Uh, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can pull this up. Does this work? Okay. Somebody sent me this message, Rushika. Um, I started my job search in January 2020 and international student, constant pressure. I used to network with people and referrals and through job portals, it wasn't getting anything. I bought the program in early February. Okay, so this is like eight, six weeks ago, actually. Started with the boss hunting, sending emails to the right people, surpassing the ATS. Since then, I have never applied to jobs online without the employer requesting me. I have never easily applied and, and never submitted multiple job apps. Between February and today, this was March 25th, 14 different companies for a role of industrial engineer. She lists the names and four offers this week, meaning like this week. So this, I mean, I, I think I clipped this out because I wanted to show you that she, you know, got in it like in February, I responded back to her to her email that said, you know, I, I ask all of my boot campers to share their story with me. So underneath this message is a, you know, are her answers so I know who she is. And I responded to her. And then a month later here, she was responding back telling me, you know, I was panicked and here I got four offers. So, I mean, this is what it, it, it it's, it's getting in motion. It's being, it's being consistent. It, you know, boss hunting I've already given you the template. You don't need you don't need to do anything. Just send them. Send them. Send them. It's about a number it it it, it, it does need to be tailored and you do need to connect you to them. But if somebody's not getting back to you, move on. Right? Move on. Move on. Move on. Believe me. It's it's consistency. It really is. Sue, Andy, love your cause and effect care during Thanksgiving and homeless and doing Going to do that, people. Everything you do, Fix It Fox, right? We were talking to Fix It Fox. I was so disappointed in myself when I gave. I don't know if it Fix It Fox is a he or a she. Whoever you are, you're awesome because you show up and you watch my videos. I was so disappointed in myself because I thought about what what that might have done to them and that's I'm so careful I try to be so careful about what I say because of the the echo and the effect and the rippling effect that it has because somebody is listening and it, it matters to them it, it, right I mean he didn't he didn't or she didn't sit here and ask a question because it did, they didn't care right they wanted my advice and what did I do I discouraged them and I shouldn't have done that oh I'm gonna I was like Oh my God, when's my next show? Yeah, you know, hope, hope Fix It Fox is there. Uh, CCAT assessments. I, uh, I don't have any thoughts on any assessments at all. Meaning, I, I don't think that they're a great way to 
Uh, I think they're fine and fun, and you can get some additional insight that you can poke around. But you're asking about my thoughts. I believe we have an unlisted video. Stacy, can you get for Janae? Actually, Stacy, you can put this. You can put this right in the chat, even though it's unlisted. Okay, give them the video that I have on YouTube that hasn't been released, where I say tests are a joke. The one that's titled "I think tests are a joke" or whatever that one is. I think it was. Um, it's from a long time ago, but give her that one and let her watch it. All right? I think you know assessment tests are a total joke, or personality tests are so like I it, I was I was, as you can see, it's unlisted. But you know what? You're my people, and there's I don't know how many of you are still here. A lot, 140, 135. Uh, give it to Janae, and anybody else who wants to watch it. Cornelia, what's up? Any suggestion for salary negotiations for a government position where their sal salary bans are rigidly defined and tend to be on the low side? You are welcome so much. Yes, when you negotiate with an institution like that or a municipality or the federal government or whoever, they do generally have hard bans. It's, so you're a G1, a G2, an H1, an H2, or whatever. What you want to negotiate is not necessarily the amount of money. You want to negotiate the level. Okay? So, so I'm not talking about dollars and cents. I'm talking about I'm not a G1, I'm a G2. And I'm a G2 because of this. Right? And then that's what lifts the rate. That's generally how you need to roll with them. And that means you got to show them that you can do the or that you're almost there, or that you're there, or whatever. By the way, can I extend that? Teachers. Teachers. My wife's a teacher. I coach a lot of her teacher friends, and I coach a lot of teachers in the boot camp. And the thing that we do when we get down to the end, and they say, okay, you're going to come into our district, or you're going to come into our whatever, and we're gonna get you, we give you X, because you're a teacher with a master's, and you teach this, and you're doing third grade, and that's what it pays. Except that what it pays was based on the years of experience that they gave you credit for that were in alignment with whatever. So it's not always just a straight, hey, you've been working 18 years, we're giving you 18 years. They don't always do it that way. Okay, so you need to make uh, an argument for how much credit they need to give you to give you a certain rate. Because once you're in, and you're if you're union or if you're whatever, you don't have any control over that. Somebody else is negotiating your contract for you. Just so keep that in mind. Johnny Stevens, I don't know what the number is. You got to make your argument. Ask for a lot. Angela G, Andy, thanks. For, you are welcome, Angela G, anytime. Ron Clark's got a question. I have been in IT for over 30 years. I was recently laid off after 18 years, 11 months. Okay, so 19 years. Uh, due to company downsizing, how many quantifiable bullet points should I include in my resume? So are you asking your whole life? Because I wouldn't, I, like, like give you an example. So I don't know, okay, I, I've been working 33 years, all right? It, my resume, if I had a resume, well, last time I had a resume, the, the bottom portion, the bottom portion of the resume bottom portion of the resume of the professional experience section was 10 years plus at Anderson Consulting, now doing business as Accenture. I had a line and a half for 10 years. So the further away today is, sorry, the further away you go from today, the less real estate the resume and the, and the clarifications and the bullets and the text and the whatever should have. So mine said something like, um, you know, associate partner or whatever I was, you know, managed large scale, you know, management and IT consulting projects of team size, you know, budgets of up to 50 million and team sizes of up to whatever. That's it. That's the whole, that was my whole bullet. 10 years. So it isn't about how many, you know, how many quantifiable bullets should I have. It's what do you want to say and what's relevant. And if you've been right, you, you, you were at the same company for 18 years, but did you have different layers? 
Did you have different titles? Did you have the same title? And were you on different projects? Like it, without, without knowing the exact makeup, it's impossible for me to say, well, you should have 10. But generally people like things in threes. And so if you have a title, like if I had 18 years, I don't, because Ron Clark, I don't know what your background looks like. If I got 18 years at a company and I would spend a little more time in what I did the last five years, I would spend, I would start squeezing bef- earlier and I would start conflating similar titles. Like for example, if you were an analyst from, you know, 2010 to 2012 and then a senior analyst from 2013 to 2014 it might say senior anal you know analyst senior anal anal senior analyst you know you know se- you know rose from analyst to senior analyst from 2010 to 2012 2014 performed this okay fine now give me more right kind of thing so it, it's it's what markets you best this is a whole, I would need to see that thing. Elijah, you found me last week. Awesome. Ask me the question. Where's the question? Fix It Fox is still here. I hope well, at least at least Fix It Fox was at Oladapo. Andy, I love your story about the homeless. It's always good to give. You have no idea how much I give. You think I give away a lot of Black Wolf Sop shows? <laughs> oh, man. I totally forgive you and appreciate your honesty. Buddy, I'm, I'm, and who, or, Whoever you are, I'm really glad. I'm really glad. Geraldine! Geraldine, I want you to know that I am your first Instagram follower and I can never not be first anymore, right? I'm so proud of you. Uh, Not related to Office Hours, friend will move this year to Chicago. Yes, you will have to visit. We'll do a mile. You come, I will set a Mile Walk Academy meetup around your your travel date. My word, right? Ann Hawkins badge, your thoughts on Echo Impact with higher education offered more online courses now than more colleges and universities now that have the online format. I love that. Will there be more part-time employees? Part-times, job shares, all that stuff. That woman that that woman that I was telling you about like the um when we were talking about tr- the transition and she's trying to get out of academia with education and technology, her MBA is online at a reputable school. And, you know, that's just, that's what happens, right? That's that trailing effect, right? There were online schools. Remember, rem- do you guys remember like University of Phoenix was the only university in the U.S. that did online? It was like, oh my God, you went to the University of Phoenix? Is that a real degree? Of course, it's a real degree, right? And like, it was a stigma. And now everybody's got online classes. All right, Mila, Andrew, you will never know who has the strength you had or even better, we need to trust in others and empower them is right. That's right. Let me see, I'm buzzing down. Sue, Andy, an internal recruiter called, yay. Sent resume, yay. She gets back tomorrow. Dream job, have all the capabilities. She knows it. Ask questions about employment gap. Next steps, please. Do I reach out to boss? No. The internal recruiter is going to get back to you. You do nothing. Do nothing until that internal recruiter gets back to you. You want to, you want to befriend the recruiter. You want this recruiter to get on your side. You want her to be your champion. Stand pat. Okay, guys, I got to get rolling. Uh, If you love this, click the thumbs up. Please share it. There's a lot of people that need help. It's going to live and breathe on YouTube. I got Productivity Monday, man. You want Andy Juju Energy? Monday it is. You get all the other stuff in the Productivity class. You get all the other stuff in the Productivity class. It's no waiting, okay? And it doesn't matter right now what plan you're on, if you're on my annual enrollment plan or the monthly enrollment plan for the leadership program. On Thursday next week, is my job search coaching program. I call it my boot camp. It used to be called the job search boot camp. They're synonymous. I often refer to them with both names because there's a lot of legacy boot campers. They'll always be boot campers to me. Uh, that is not on special. It's five ninety seven. dollars uh, But, you know, if you email Kara, she might take care of you. Support at milewalk.com. I tell her I don't want to know. 
just get them in there, okay? That's the way we roll because I don't want to gouge you. I want you in. I want to help you. But what's happening is there's so much more stuff in there and it's requiring so much more time to support. I'm doing so much more live that, that we're looking at what's the appropriate price point for this. So I hope you get in. I hope you enjoyed today. I really trying to bring you different stuff, but I want this to have a long-term effect on how you look at cause and effect. What happens? What happens next? What should I be thinking? I need to slow down. I need to remember Andy's homeless story, right? You guys, be great. Love you. See you soon.